This is our third class um, on the Acts of the Apostles, and tonight we're going to be talking about uh, the issue of a, the struggle for organization within the ecclesia. Uh, this may seem to us something that we would just kind of assume. All, all of us have been born, uh, many of us, I should say, have been born as Christadelphians, and we kind of grew up with a, a process and a way that things get done. Uh, but this was this was a big challenge for them to figure out who they were going to be and how they were going to do it. And so the struggle for ecclesial organization is what we're going to be talking about tonight. And it really has to do with this issue of making major decisions. How do you make major decisions in life? Uh, you know, if you think about the way that we're taught to make decisions in school, we're taught to use our brains to uh, you know, kind of sort out the different options, get gathered data together, and then use our ingenuity to come up with a decision. And if you're working with other people, you might gather them together. Uh, and being able to make a decision uh, is it's something that's pretty fundamental in life. We, you know, we make uh, a lot of decisions every single day, but the big major decisions that we make in life uh, those are the ones that really requires us to stop and to pause and to think. Uh, they, it requires us to, um, uh, to really apply spiritual thinking to that decision. So in the first century, they were facing a lot of big decisions, a lot of them. The very first one um, was the appointment of Judas. You might think that that's not a big decision. That's a big decision. Um, and we're going to talk about that one. Uh, we're going to talk also about the uh, developing role of the apostles, because at the beginning, the apostles did everything, you know, and you can see that tendency sometimes within Christadelphia, where you can have certain people who are highly talented people doing everything. That's not real. I cannot look at that mask. <laughs> anyway, um, the I'm sorry, you can wear it. Um, the developing role of apostles um, was something that was really something special because, as you can imagine, why not let the apostles do pretty much everything? They, they were the apostles. Um, and as we see time develop, we see that they were doing just about everything. So the idea about how do we have division of labor? How do we, how does it get to be beyond that first 120 and the 12 apostles to getting more and more people involved in the work? And when you give people assignments and tasks, does that mean that they no longer have any responsibility? So we'll talk about that. They had the issue of doctrine and the application of the law of Moses. That's a huge fight that we see that goes on really throughout almost all of the, uh, the New Testament. And then how to embrace and include Gentiles and Gentile ecclesias into what was really uh, Jewish synagogues at the beginning and Jewish ecclesias. Wow. And then finally, the real challenge is how to find unity as you were growing in diversity. So look, if, if you have a whole bunch of people that think the same way, they were brought up the same way, uh, it's really easy to make decisions. Even then, we still have difficulties. If everybody is the same, it's so easy for us to share the same points of view and to say, well, we wouldn't even consider that particular idea. Basically, we have a certain mindset that we all kind of share together. And I suppose that that's true from families. It's true for regional areas. Uh, and certainly when you look nationally, it's true too. And in the first century, there was a little bit of that going on. They were all people who had been brought up with a knowledge of the Bible, with Judaism, with an understanding of scripture that was fairly deep. And that was kind of the, that was the situation initially. And even then there was some diversity. But of course, what was going to happen very soon is you were going to have incredible diversity. Uh, maybe not Mexico with a sombrero there, but you were going to have incredible diversity that was going to be happening very, very rapidly. And it's going to reflect things about the way you preach. You can't preach to a person who's never seen scripture about the scriptures. 
Have you ever noticed that, that the Apostle Paul's preaching to the Gentiles is very different than when they preach in the synagogues? You have to preach differently. And so the idea about things like um, you know, idolatry and things like uh, fornication, all these things were, they were so differently thought about in the cultures that they were now going into. So you had incredible diversity. And yet through all of that, you knew that there was one body, not multiple bodies, there was one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. And that unity is what was so difficult to find and yet so challenging to find uh, whenever you had increasing diversity. So to me, one of the big stories of the Acts of the Apostles is you start off with a group of people who had been together for three years. Many of them were related, right? Many of them were, were brothers, physically were brothers, mothers, um, family members. And we go from that to a period at the end of the Acts of the Apostles where the gospel has now gone to the uttermost parts and you have people that are in Rome. Imagine the difference between a person who's a believer in Rome that's now become part of the body and yet look at the experience that they've had in the city of Rome compared to what you might have had growing up in places like Capernaum or even down in Judea. So this is really the big issue. And of course, why is Acts even important to us? It's not just a historical look back so we can feel like we understand the Acts of the Apostles a little better. It's really about our time too. Because when we think about diversity and increasing diversity in the body, that's what's going on right now. The diversity in our body is that... Um, that the changes that have happened in the past 20 to 30 years are remarkable. And so we have people who are with very different perspectives, different cultures, different economic situations, um, different maybe expectations in life who are now part of our body and are as much Christadelphian as you and I, or you and me. So that's really what we're going to be talking about as we go through this. So the real challenge is to find unity in the midst of diversity. That's hard. Because it actually means that you need to respect the differences between people and find a way with differences to be one. That's still a challenge for us today, isn't it? Um, Brother Dennis uh, Gallette wrote in uh, The Genius of Discipleship, which if you don't have this book, I recommend it pretty highly. It's one of the better books we have. He said about unity, he said, so let us understand it rightly. The unity of the spirit is not absolute uniformity. It's not all green apples, but it's harmonization of different forces brought together for a common purpose. And in the realization of that purpose made one, this is the unity of the spirit. So, Having different points of view, I remember Richard's class that he gave uh, when he was talking about the different points of view in the first century. It's true today, too. If we were all green apples with no differences in point of view, we would not be richer as a body. What makes us richer as a body is being one together in purpose, in a common purpose, and one through Christ. Okay. So... What it's really saying is the ecclesia is not supposed to look like the gra the granule, uh, the little grains in the seashore, which you can't differentiate. You go to the beach, you look at the sand, you can't say, well, over there are larger ones and small. They all are mixed up and you can't tell the difference. Really, what it is, is more like this, that everybody brings a different perspective, a different color to the, to the, the view of the scripture. And when I see this, I see this in our Bible reading group that we've been doing now for 15 plus months. We all read the same scriptures all the time. And it's amazing what different views and perspectives people bring to those classes. They'll say, well, I see this in a different way. And then you hear it and you go, wow, why didn't I see that before? And that's really the beauty of the diversity that we get 
in this one body. Now, when we think about the one body in the first century, we got to understand from the beginning, they had a lot of diversity. In fact, it's almost like you might think they were all green apples, but they were far from it. Because when we get there, we find that you had one, you had Jews and Gentiles. Well, we know about that division. But we also know, we're going to talk a little bit today about the Grecian and the Hebraic Jews. Grecian Jews doesn't mean that they were from Greece. It means they probably spoke Greek. They had a background that perhaps was outside of Judea. And then you had the Hebraic Jews. So we're going to look at those two groups. Um, there, then you had these heritage ecclesias, like there was only one ecclesia in, well, there probably were more than one ecclesia in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem, the ecclesias there were powerful forces in the first century, but you also had ecclesias that were developing all across the Roman Empire. And we said before, you had teaching style differences. Uh, if you preach to the Jews, you could open up the scripture. How about Stephen? Stephen walks through the Bible to make his point so beautifully by being able to demonstrate that God was with man. He was with Israel, actually, and with man long before um, there was, uh, they were in the land. It had nothing to do with God being uh, associated with only worship in the temple. In fact, that Abraham had been reached whenever he was in Mesopotamia. And it goes on and it demonstrates this wonderfully. What would that have meant to a person in Corinth who had never opened up scripture before? Nothing, nothing. And so the way that they were going to teach was going to have to be different. We also know that there were a lot of different groups. We think to ourselves, oh, we got, you know, we've got unamended, we've got uh, CJF, we've got uh, the central group. We have, we have actually quite a few groups, but they had the sect of the Pharisees that were believers, by the way, and still were retaining their identification as Pharisees. We had priests who became believers. We saw that a little bit last week. Um, we had those who were of the party of the circumcision, and they become a problem in that what they were assisting is the only way for the Gentiles to be saved was to keep the full law of Moses, and yet they were part of the body. Then there were those who were the disciples of John the Baptist who kind of had come in uh, into this afterwards. There were divisions within ecclesias based on who baptized you when we get to Corinth. And then there was, of course, a huge differentiation about the spirit gifts that were distributed. You know, some people got the gift of tongues and some got prophecy. I mean, the ability to interpret tongues and uh, all these different ones. And you can imagine that there was a lot of differentiation, but it was all intended for this group to be one, even though there were certainly many body, uh, many different identities. And even the name, you know, it's quite interesting as you go through um, the Acts of the Apostles and into the scriptures in the New Testament, um, what were they called? Well, they were called Christians first where? Antioch. Antioch. That's where they were first called Christians. And I don't think it was actually intended to be a positive term. Uh, the names Nazarene or the saints or the holy people, the disciples, the friends, uh, believers, and probably the one that I think that was the one most used was the way. Um, so the, the names for the early ecclesia gives you the idea that it, it, it wasn't just like one uh, shingle on the, uh, on the, on the uh, house. It was uh, a group that had probably different names. Uh, and beyond that, uh, a lot of different identities within that first century group. Um, F.F. Bruce, in his book, uh, The Spreading Flame, he said this, Judaism before 70 AD was much more variegated, that means, you know, differentiated, than afterwards. And there was room within it for a great diversity of parties and schools, provided that they all maintained the central loyalty to the Jewish faith in one God and to the Jewish way of life. So you can call yourself all kinds of things as long as you're still a Jew, as long as you basically keep the law of Moses. Uh, and that was, that was pretty much what held them together. Of course, the problem with this is uh, what we're going to see as we get to the Jerusalem conference here today 
is that the dominance of this Judaism, of Judaism, is about to dramatically change. It's all about the ecclesia in Jerusalem. That's where they go for the big decisions. That's where the apostles were located for much of the time. And yet, in a very short time, it was going to be gone. And so the temple, we're told, was going to come to an end very soon. And the writer of the Hebrews talks about this when he says, you know, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside, without the gate. Let us go therefore, uh, go forth therefore unto him, outside or without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here, in Jerusalem, we have no continuing city. We seek one to come. That's a pretty fundamental message, that the city of Jerusalem, as was prophesied by the Lord himself, was going to, as they knew it, come to an end. And so instead of thinking about offering sacrifices in the temple, the new uh, vision is to offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. So the temple was coming to an end soon. Judaism, as they knew it, was coming to an end soon. And by the time we get to 70 AD, the, you know, the cataclysmic event occurs, which goes on for a few years. And finally, what happens is really the major diaspora happens, and most of those who were Jews, and this is what Gordon talked about a couple of weeks ago, left the area um, of Israel and dispersed. And uh, we can go to places throughout Europe today and see the footprint of large populations of Jews who moved into places uh, throughout Europe and uh, throughout uh, Northern Africa. Okay, so that's kind of the backdrop for this. So let's now look at decision making. And let's take an, we're going to just look at three examples today. I wish we had more time, but we don't. So let's take a look at just three decisions that they had to make. So, first of all, how do you make decisions? Well, remember that Jesus had spent three and a half years with them, showing them the proper ways to make decisions, how to pray how to think about variables that they had not thought about before, how to go back to the real basics of what the truth was, was that was being taught in scripture and to get that. Um, and, but after his ascension, it was not like he left, as we said before, a notebook or a handbook that said, when you have this kind of problem, I want you to get back together, open up this page. It'll tell you how to resolve the issue about how to handle the law of Moses for Gentiles. There was nothing like that. Um, and the other thing is that they didn't really know how long it was going to be that they were going to have Jerusalem in the temple. Uh, Jesus had given them the prophecy, gave them a few signs, but the issue is when you think about the way that they survived in, in Jerusalem, how was it they were taking care of each other economically? What were they doing? Yeah, right. Selling all their stuff. Sell all their stuff. How long can that last? It's a short term. It's a, and I will never forget Art Clark saying these words to me. That is a short term economic strategy. <laughs> In fact, they sold everything. And then on top of that, they were then dependent on people from out, throughout Asia who would send in contributions for the poor that were in Jerusalem. And so they had limited information about how long this was going to happen with Jerusalem and what that was going to mean. As we see in Acts chapter 6, they had their hands into everything, and they were overburdened. And what emerged was because of too much work, it meant that there was an expansion of the body of Christ, more people getting involved, different names coming into play. And so how they worked out decision-making is uh, it's really of great value to us in our ecclesias and hope to be able to establish that today. So one of the first things about decision making is we all want to go to, to God in prayer at the, at the really at the outset to ask for his guidance. But we also have to remember that if you ask the question, you have to be prepared for the answer. You might remember that Zedekiah sent um, a pasher uh, and to uh, and along with others to, to Jeremiah saying, hey, can you find out uh, for us, as it says in verse two, inquire, pray, I pray thee, 
of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, maketh war against us, if so be that the Lord will deal with us according to all his wondrous works that he may go up from us. Well, that was the question that they asked. But do you remember what the response was in Jeremiah 21? The response was, you're going to fail. In fact, I'm going to fight with Babylon against you. So there's sometimes when we ask questions, we might think every time we ask a question, it's going to turn out the way we want. Well, certainly, that's not what we see in this occasion in Jeremiah. So how did they kind of make decisions in the old days? Well, it was really great when they had the Urim and Thummim, right? They could go and they could ask, and the high priest could make this decision or with the, with the two stones. But casting lots was another way they did that. Remember, whenever they had to find out, after they had had the Battle of Jericho really successful, then they had the Battle of Ai, and they lost a lot of men. I forgot the number of men they lost, but it was a large number. And they lost them, and, and they found out that there was some iniquity within Israel. Do you remember how they found out that it was Achan? They drew lots. And the lot fell on a particular family, and eventually he got down to Achan, and then he confessed. You remember the scapegoat. How was the scapegoat selected? It was by the drawing of lots. And of course, even with Jonah, remember, they wanted to know who is the one that's causing this terrible ship uh, situation. And the lot fell on Jonah, and they knew who it was. So the idea of casting lots was kind of a way that they had relied on in the past. But those things weren't really available to the same degree. And I would suggest we're going to see one example of a casting of lots for a particular reason in the Acts of the Apostles. Just one other thing, and that is, as we look at the roles in the first century, Look what we see in the, in the Acts of the Apostles uh, for the number of people involved in decision-making. Uh, you've got the apostles, the elders, the ecclesias themselves, ministers, disciples, and it goes on and on. There's a long list of people. And as we move on to we get to the time of the epistles, you see that there were uh, really a lesser group. There were uh, about four different groups, the elders the bishops, the deacons, and the ministers. And it's important to understand that the elders were those who presided over assemblies. They were presiders. Uh, the bishops were then those who oversaw things and were presiding officers also. The deacons were simply those who were servants or ministers and or attendants. And then finally, the ministers were people who were really like waiters or servants uh, that executed commands. So that's what we see in the apostles, and, and I should say in the epistles. And then finally, in the first century, where do they get their decisions from? Really, they get direct revelation. This is the uniqueness of the first century from Jesus and the work of the Comforter. They get told certain things. What we're also going to see is their fantastic reliance upon the Scripture. And I, this is what's so fascinating to me. And the last one, which I'm going to suggest to you, we may have gone on the extreme on this one. You know, there's one side, which is evangelicals, which says, you know, the Lord told me that you should give me your car. Or the Lord told me that I don't need to, uh, to go to bed tonight at this hour. I, I can hear a kid saying that. Or, you know, all these direct revelations that you might think of. The other side of it is, we all have experiences, and we can learn from them. And so we're going to take a look at how they actually did this in the first century. So here's our first uh, major decision. Replacing Judas Iscariot. It happens in chapter one, right? We have the 120 that are there, and now Peter stands up and says, look, um, we have 11 apostles. And the question is, should we replace him? Why replace him? Well, there's a, there's a logistical problem, because you might remember that Jesus had said, whenever they asked him, what shall we have? And he said, you're all going to be sitting on 12 thrones, uh, judging over the 12 tribes of Israel. But there's only 11 of them right now. So that 
kind of seems like a problem. And beyond that, they looked into their scriptures and they were able to find more than one passage that they could tie back to what must have been the case with Judas. And so they found in Psalm, thir- um, in, uh, oops, Psalm 69 at verse 25, um, where it talks about that there can't be, let there can't be a desolation, uh, let no one dwell in their tents. This is about uh, undoubtedly about Ahithophel, but uh, referring also to Judas, and then the one that was probably most useful in Psalm 109, uh, that his, may his days be few, and may another take his office. So there was a real understanding that there was a need to replace the one who betrayed. Okay, so that was, that was useful for them to do that, but still, it was Jesus who selected the apostles. And I think that for good reason, they felt it's not really our right to appoint the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how did they make this decision? So the first decision is this. You got to go to scripture. Always go to scripture first. What you do is you look to see what are the things that would were similar to this in scripture. And then do what you can and select the criteria and narrow the candidate pool. So there were all these people who could potentially be apostles, and they thought to themselves, well, let's think about this and see what we can do kind of to narrow the pool to people that the Lord would have considered. And so what they did is they used this criteria in Acts chapter 1. They looked at these things, men that had been with them all the time, starting from the baptism of John and going to the day that Jesus was taken up and were witness to the resurrection so that they had the full experience of of the time with Jesus from the time of the the baptism of John the Baptist um, all the way through the ministry, through his crucifixion, and were witnesses of his resurrection. That was going to be important. And so What they did is they looked at all the candidates and they came up with two people, two people that were going to be possibilities. One was Joseph called Barsabas and the other one was Justice, who was called Matthias. Then what they did is they prayed and they asked for the Lord to make the decision. I think this is a unique situation in the Acts of the Apostles because we don't see decisions from here on done by casting of lots. The decision was made by casting of lots because they wanted the Lord himself, I believe, to be the one who would select the 12th apostle. And the interesting thing is the 12th apostle that's selected as Matthias, we never hear about him again, not once in scripture. And we don't even hear of the other person, which is Joseph Barsabas, though we do hear, I think, about his brother. And the question was, was Matthias one of those who Jesus considered in the original 12. Well, we don't know that, but he would have been pers- a person that would have been with them and part of that consideration. And so the other comment is that, as we said last week, death doesn't end apostleship. That's important. In the 12th chapter, when James is killed, they do not replace James, but they do replace Judas, as was told to them in scripture. So this is what that replacement process looks like. First thing happens is that Peter identifies the problem. Next thing he does is he engages the ecclesia. He brings them together, men and brethren. And then he says, we need to go to scripture. They go to scripture and they look for scriptural precedent. They find passages in, uh, in uh, in the Psalms that would have been useful for that. And then they begin with that backdrop, with those principles, to make reasonable conclusions about how they could select candidates. Then they go back to the ecclesia and say, okay, here's the criteria. Please select candidates. And what the ecclesia does is they come up with two people, then they pray, and then they cast lots and accept the decision. So that's a kind of interesting process because it's really a process we kind of use today in many ways. The first thing is engagement of the ecclesia. 
if there's a problem in modern ecclesias, oftentimes the whole ecclesia will be addressed. And in other ecclesias, they have delegated that to the arranging brethren. And the arranging brethren will work through those problems and then come back to the ecclesia with recommendations. The next thing is you must go to scripture. You must know your Bibles and you must look for answers within scripture. And then the last one, which is the casting of lots. You know, um, I remember my brother and I, we, we'd always, would, we, we would, uh, when we were really bored, bored and long before video games, we would flip coins and see who would get the most tails and the most uh, heads. You know, we'd do this for sometimes hours. Um, well, there's no two out of three on this one. They accepted it and they moved on. And I think that's important to be able to accept those kind of ideas. Okay, so let's look now at the second major de um, decision that they do, which is um, the division of tasks. This is the one that deals with the, uh, the widows. So let's move on. All right, so the second major decision was this one about the widows. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking, but I'm gonna assume that you have some knowledge of that. Um, that the one of the things that we hear about is that the widows felt like they were being discriminated. Which ones? The Greek speaking felt that they were being discriminated against uh, in the daily distribution of food. Now, I want to, we're going to pause on that in a moment and ask a question about that. And then it goes on to say the 12, this is the New Living Translation, the 12 called a meeting of all the believers, and they said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. Now, that's, that's modern language, right? Um, and so, brothers, brothers, select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then the apostles can spend, then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. So what was happening is that they were so busy taking care of physical necessities for these widows that it was eating into the time that they would have to be able to do the things of teaching and praying. You can imagine how over time, Trying to do it all, they would just about wear down. So again, we have a, I'm not going to take time to go through this here, but they have a similar kind of process here. Have you ever wondered why they have so many widows? The, the actual persecution that had been, been leading them to have them hauled off and so forth actually seems to be a little after this. So you might ask yourself, why, why so many widows? I mean, first of all, where, where was a widow indeed just prior to this? It was Anna. Where did she get her sustenance? In the temple, from Judaism, right? And so you might say that the first of the persecutions possibly wasn't really the physical, but the economic. You want to be part of that group, that's fine, but don't come here expecting that we're going to take care of your physical needs. Just a suggestion to you that that might have been the first persecution, because you ask yourself, why are these widows turning to this new group to get their, their sustenance and not going to the normal place, which would be uh, in Jerusalem, into the temple? Um, because now there are two groups, those who are both Hebraic, who would have been the responsibility of these Judean Jews, and also those who were maybe born outside of Judea. And the murmuring that was being caused by the Greek-speaking widows that were claiming that they were being overlooked in the distribution. This is they're claiming the overlook in the distribution by the apostles. The apostles aren't, they're, they're discriminating against me. That's basically what's been said. You can see the potential here for a great rift of people who are saying it's not, it's not all fair. We're not all one body. It kind of depends whether you're Hebraic or if you're Grecian. All right. So that's one question for us. So who is selected? Well, it's quite interesting to me that they select these seven people. 
Um, and we see the names here, um, Philip, Procurus, uh, Nicanor, Time, uh, Timon, Parmenas, Parmenas uh, and Nicholas in Antioch, and of course, Stephen. So we see these people who were selected. And the interesting thing about the selection of these seven, who were, by the way, who selected them? The Ecclesia. The Ecclesia selected them. And they all appear to be Grecian Jews. And one of them was a proselyte. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing that the Ecclesia made this selection. If you're going to have people who are complaining that they're being discriminated based on being Grecian Jews, not a bad idea to have Grecian Jews be the ones who are going to take care of their needs, and one of, e of which is even a proselyte. And of course, we know that in that group, Stephen, what he's, it even has a little pause and it talks about how he was so incredibly uh, full of faith and power and he did miracles. And here's a man you would say, we want to hold him back to do something else, right? Not waiting on tables. This is a man who was of great capability, but yet waiting on tables was something that apparently he was pleased to do. And then we hear, of course, about the next person, which was Philip, who goes on, uh, goes up to Samaria, goes down to the Ethiopian eunuch in Gaza, goes up the coast, creating ecclesias until he gets to Caesarea. And then there in the Book of Martyrs, we read about the other ones, uh, some of the others that were there. Um, uh, Timon and also Parmenas were both killed, according to Josephus, along with James, the apostle, in Acts chapter 12. And then Procurus and Nicanor and Nicholas are never mentioned again by name. So the question is, did they stay in Jerusalem taking care of the widows? I, I want to share for the group uh, on Zoom what uh, Eric just said. We overlay our 21st century thinking on taking care of welfare needs, right? And thinking that might not be real high. When we get to James chapter 1, verse 27, what does it say true religion is? Care, that's exactly right. Take care of the, the needs of the widows and the orphans. And, though, that, and that is really fundamentally one of the identities that we can have as whether or not we embrace truth is do we take care of the needs of those who are most vulnerable. Okay, so let's look at the decision process. They selected seven men and they appointed them over the business. So the question is, whenever they said, you guys got it, did they walk away and not have any import, any responsibility anymore? Is that the way it works? If the, if the arranging brethren decide to create a committee for preaching, does the preaching committee only have responsibility for preaching? And I think that's kind of important. What they were doing is enlisting people to do the work and to own that work but the needs of the widows remained important to the apostles. It allowed them to do other work, but they didn't wash their hands of that particular work. And I think this is an important thing in Ecclesias. Delegating responsibility to the seven didn't mean they didn't have any more responsibility for the needs of the widows, but that they had appointed what they believed to be sound brethren to take care of their needs. And we read this in the Ecclesial Guide when Robert Roberts says, Official brethren are only brethren performing an office for the good of the rest. And to some extent, this shuts the door against corruption, which has generated the apostasy and developed clerical suspicion. In other words, all we do, we all are serving one another and the best interest of each other. So real quickly, where did they get this idea to appoint the seven? Well, the first thing, why did they get the idea that they should themselves be doing something else? It goes back to the 18th chapter of Exodus when Moses is walking along with his father-in-law and his father-in-law is, is watching him every day from the beginning of the morning until the evening, judging every single case. And I'm sure sometimes they were big ones. And a lot of times they were really minute little things. And, he, and Jethro pulls him aside and he says, look, he says, you're going to wear down. He says, the thing that you're doing is not good. You will surely wear away both you and this people that's with you. 
And so what he says is, be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shall show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Oh, that's interesting. Jethro, um, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, sees something that Moses doesn't see. And that is, you've got to get other people involved in the work. And he says, what you need to do is get involved in prayer and teaching. And just the big items come to you. Well, that's what Moses does. And he appoints the 70, not the seven. So where do we get the seven number from? Well, you might remember when they had all the stuff that was coming in from uh, at the time of Hezekiah, when they were stacking up all the things that were contributed to the Levites, it literally was stacking up in the temple. And what they did is they had an overabundance of it, and they needed an oversight group. So I think they went to Second Chronicles. And what did they find out? Seven people were responsible for distribution. There you go. There's where your answers are. We don't have to make this up ourselves. The ideas are there. The examples are there. And so what did they do? They themselves devoted themselves to prayer and teaching, and they found seven men who were able to be appointed by the ecclesia. So what does this emphasize to us today? If you have a problem that you're facing, go to scripture and find who it was that had an example like this in scripture. What was the issue that was dealt with? And is there a clear principle that can be seen in scripture that can provide you with a spiritual decision? And so I think the message to every individual here, every committee that's trying to figure something out, arranging brethren or, or continental committees or whatever they might be, where we must start is not with our own ingenuity and what feels right to us, what our historical experience is, back to scripture. Has this arisen before in scripture? Is there a principle? That's job one. Find that. All right. So the last one we're going to look at is uh, the Jerusalem conference. Well, by the way, this could take the rest of the of the evening to go through this, but we'll just look briefly at it. So where does the problem that they deal with in Jerusalem start? What city? Antioch. Not in Jerusalem. It starts way up here, outside of the region, outside of Israel, in Antioch. That's where the problem starts. Now, a couple of backdrop things that are important for us. One of the major people that's going to be involved here is James, the half-brother of Jesus. Now, we, we talked a little bit about James. Um, James is an incredibly important person in the first century. And you almost, Jerusalem and Jerusalem leadership and James become almost synonymous. And what we see is that what we're told back in Mark is that he wasn't a believer that they were, um, that he was, as we see, his, we're told in John chapter 7, for neither did his brethren believe in him. But we know that one of the first people that Jesus comes to after the resurrection is his brother, James. And I think that's incredibly important because what he does is he allows James to be able to not only believe in him, but to recognize the great work that was set before him. And he has a growing role because from about the mid 40s AD until the time of about 70 AD, the apostles were spending less and less time uh, in the city of Jerusalem, but James was there. And he would have been kind of the one who would have led the council of elders. The Jerusalem conference posed the threat of a huge split that could have happened, not only between Jerusalem and Antioch, but really all of those Gentile ecclesias. So this is what I find interesting. It wasn't all green apples like we showed you on that first uh, slide. It wasn't all people that came together in this Jerusalem conference that were all of the same mind at all. In fact, I think that's what's remarkable is that they had very different points of view and they found something 
that they could agree together on. Now look at the process. First of all, you had men from Judea. They're the ones that caused this problem. These men from Judea, without any permission, went up to Antioch and told all the believers that were Gentiles, you got to keep the law of Moses, you got to be circumcised. And they had no permission to do this. And so what happens is Paul and Barnabas come down to Jerusalem, and then they end up meeting with others, Pharisee believers, Pharisee believers who did believe that the Gentiles must keep the law of Moses. You had Peter, you had Paul and Barnabas, and you had James, and then you had the elders. And it's kind of, kind of interesting here that you remember last week we talked about the work of the angel, that what they did in chapter, in chapter 12 was they saw the party of the circumcision saw the conversion of Gentiles. Now, that's a ways before, but now when we get to the 15th chapter, that's going to be pretty important. So the context has already been available for them. Stephen demonstrated that Abraham was called and given the promise when he was yet uncircumcised. The Samaritans in chapter 8 with Philip had responded and been baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch believed. Peter had the vision of the unclean animals on a sheet. And then Peter goes to the centurion's home, into his home, and then sees that conversion. And then finally, Peter declares in chapter 11 that the Gentiles are officially accepted. But that wasn't believed by everybody that was in Jerusalem. And the first consideration was this, experience. Now, I find this remarkable. Instead of starting off with a Bible, with, with their Bibles and saying, this is exactly what the Bible says on this matter. They started off by talking about what is the Lord doing amongst us? And Peter talked about how the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel. And then Paul and Barnabas talked about the wonders that God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And as they did this, everybody was pleased to hear that. Glad to hear the Gentiles are coming along. But you can't just have only experience, because James then brings the scriptural re a reasoning. Not a verse I would have used, by the way, to make my point on this one, but it certainly does work, obviously. In Acts 15, he goes all the way back to the, uh, the tabernacle of David, how that it was the residue of men that they might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles. I'm going to go quickly through this. Um, Right through that. Basically, it goes back to Chronicles, where Solomon had taken a census, and all the foreigners in the land of Israel were involved, and it was 153,600 that were involved in the making up of this tabernacle. So James makes a proposal, and I want you to look closely at this proposal. He doesn't say, look, I'm the half-brother of Jesus. I'm the one here in Jerusalem. You need to listen to me. And by the way, the apostles are all on the same page here. You need to listen and do what we say. This is what he says. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent, therefore, Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay no greater burden on these than these necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well, fare ye well. That's the letter that they're going to send out, and it's going to be delivered uh, by these chosen men. Now, pass this quickly here. A few observations about this. I want you to notice that in Acts chapter 15, in the letter that was written by the apostles, if anybody had authority, it was the apostles, right? They never have a hint of command. They never say, you need to do this. You better do this. They say, this appears to be right to us. It seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. And also, 
to the scriptures, it was cons consistent with scripture. And also the ecclesias were seen as being autonomous and there was no central authority to tell people what they must do. No shade of a central authority for the ecclesias. And then there is a condemnation of those who had come from Judea and done that work. And the three requirements are these. You don't have to become a Jew, but you have to stop being a pagan. Those are words from A.D. Norris when he talked about this. I thought he really captured that. If you stop doing those things, which are you know eating of blood and things strangled, fornication, uh, and uh, what is idolatry, if you stop doing those things, then you won't be following the things that are of paganism. And so the Holy Spirit didn't mean that there wouldn't be debate or conflict. So when we face difficult decisions, we don't want to squelch people from giving their opinions. We want to get the opinions from those who are in the room. Look for points of agreement. And the agreement on this one, aren't we all satisfied and happy that the Gentiles are coming to the truth? And each point then, each point of view was voiced while the other parties sit quietly and listen and gave audience. And the experience was that was given by Paul and by Barnabas and by Peter was deemed valid, but it was scripture that provided the real direction and the means of agreement. And at the end, they found a way to do it and be all in one accord. And then it was sent out to Antioch and to other ecclesias and uh, communicated. So the question is, did it work? Well, that's kind of debatable. Um, we find in Titus that there were those of the circumcision uh, that were still involved in, in that work. Uh, in, Gal in Galatia, we find that they were still there. Uh, but it's interesting that the Apostle Paul, whenever he was really almost left with nobody else to help him, in Colossians chapter 4, he talks about justice, who was of the circumcision, and he was one of those who was his fellow helper. So again, it wasn't siloing and pushing away, but what, finding a way to work together in one accord. So what's a risk today? Unity and diversity is often resisted. It can be resisted by mandates of those whose personal preference or their personal point of view is matched by perceived power or maybe even threats. And the challenge is either to agree or disagree in a way that promotes unity and the gospel. And the more we strive for uniformity, the less we are to practice unity in diversity. So you might ask yourself, I think we're kind of out of time here, but you might ask yourself to think about experience that you've had, that your ecclesia's had, that your family's had, that Christadelphia's having. What does that speak to us today about? What does that tell us about our own decisions and, the, and our own ways of doing things? You know, we see great changes that are going on in certain parts of the world. How does that experience speak to us just as they were sharing their experiences in the first century? So in summary, there were no spirit gifts that mitigated conflict of ideas. Brothers and sisters were tasked with diligently searching the scripture and paying careful attention and looking for the principles that they could apply. And decisions involved difficult buy-in and oftentimes direct involvement by the ecclesia to get there. And the decisions were communicated in writing and they were delivered through reliable brethren. And finally, decisions were not dominated by a few, not by the loudest, nor positioned as being mandatory. They were spiritual appeals to loving brethren.